the new American household. In America today, more than 60 million people live in multi-generational households. That number is so large that it may seem difficult to believe. But the truth is that vast numbers of young adults have had to move back in with their parents and grandparents in recent years due to the deteriorating economy. I'm not talking about small children here. I'm talking about 20-somethings, 40-somethings who have been out there on their own for a number of years and become victims of federal tyranny and have retreated to their parents' homes to rebuild their lives. Most of them would rather have their own lives back. They would prefer that their businesses didn't go broke or that their employer would not have been forced out of business by federal regulations. Most of them fully intend to get back out there and try again once they honor their creditors and pay off their debts. But here's the problem. Millions of our young people cannot find decent jobs once they leave school. And millions of them are absolutely overwhelmed by debt. But what is the root cause of the problem. Some might argue that these young people are lazy, but that is rare, I can tell you. Most of them are using their parents' pad as a safety net, but why do they need it? Some call it bad judgment with a credit card. Some call it college debt. Some call it the high cost of living with a vastly depressed wage base. Well, according to the Pew Research Center, 12% of the U.S. population was living in multi-generational households back in 1980. Today, that number is up to 19%. That means nearly one in five U.S. adults now live with their parents or their grandparents. People can argue that kids today won't drive an older car with high miles because that's all they can afford. One of the big culprits the left would have you believe, of course, is student loan debt. According to CNN, approximately 70% of all college students will have student loan debt to pay off once they leave school. And the average loan balance for those graduates is only $28,950. You know, that's typical. And it's not too bad to pay off, actually. I had spent about $48,000, and I paid back every dime of it with interest, with my earnings, while I raised four kids. Now, did I buy a new car? No. Did I buy a big house? Nope. That's the way it is if you intend to pay back your student loans. You got the knowledge. Now go apply it. But there are many that run up $100,000 in debt at high-end schools for degrees that prepare you to be a community barnacle. When I was an engineering manager, I had a boss who had a degree in Middle Eastern studies. Really? Yes, really. Talk about worthless. Yes, he was. I encourage young people to apply to the best schools that they possibly can. And I recommend that they should focus on fields of study that will earn a good living by being productive to society. I assure them that they will be able to easily pay back any debts once they leave college because of the good jobs that they will get upon graduation. Of course, it means they cannot take on any other debts until that loan is paid back. But do they listen? Hell no. Now, that does not change the fact that millions upon millions of our young people have discovered that the good jobs that they were promised simply don't exist. Oh, they don't exist for 30-year-olds either. And they don't exist for 40-year-olds. And after 50, they get even more rare. In fact, If you are a degreed professional in America today over the age of 59, you are facing almost certain unemployment for the rest of your life if things continue the way Obama has them set up. Dodd-Frank, you've heard of this onerous act, right? Dodd-Frank makes it illegal 
for banks to loan money to startups, which ensures there will never be any jobs for anyone unless they're government jobs. The current unemployment rate for experienced degreed engineers in North Carolina over the age of 55 is close to 35%. 35%? After 60, it is closer to 65% unemployment. The old saying that if you cannot get a job, you make a job has been rendered meaningless because Obama has hunted down and solicited every investor in America so hard that they are now hiding outside the country. After nearly 20 years of earnestly paying off credit card debt, Americans' use of credit cards has recently been creeping up again. Household debt in the United States increased by $35 billion, $12.29 trillion during the second quarter of 2016. That's a 0.3% rise from the previous quarter that was driven by credit cards and auto loans, according to a report released this last Tuesday by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And by the way, that is money that earns the bank's 30% interest on a balance that is set up to remain constant for at least 50 years if you make the minimum payments. Oh, and those car loans I told you about? Take a good look at the next mortgage bubble about to burst. Millions upon millions of car loans are in danger of complete default, except this time there's nothing of any value to back those loans Less than 5% of the cars are worth the lien against the title. We often criticize the federal government for being $19.4 trillion in debt, and rightly so. But let us not forget that U.S. households are $12.2 trillion in debt. And for what? For nothing. For nothing at all to show for the debt. Restaurants, movies, alcohol, clothes, groceries. We are a society that feels entitled to everything, and we are not afraid to go into debt to get it. And unfortunately, we have passed on this entitlement mentality to the next generation. We want frequent flyer miles. We want hotel points. We want 1% cash back, and we want it now. Listen, people, you are in charge. Most of you will pay for your own higher education. Face it. And if you don't get it, you are most certainly relegated to working on a factory line, if you can be lucky enough to get a job like that. Your parents are overprotective. I'm sorry. You just are. You prevent your children from playing outside and making mistakes that you had a chance to make to gain that thick skin. You don't let your 12-year-old kids stay at home alone because they are too young. And who was wrong when your child has a conflict at school? I'll bet you it's the other kid, right? I bet you always blame the other side, not your special snowflake. And you are surprised when the whole generation is offended by facing the truth? You are just another plastic player trying to look good. It must hurt, right? This generation of young adults is the most educated in our history, and yet they also appear to be one of the least competent. Half of American millennials score below the minimum standard of literacy proficiency. Only two countries scored worse by that measure. Italy at 60% and Spain at 59%. Did you know that 67% of college students in other countries scored better than America in math. That placed U.S. millennials dead last for math among the study's 22 developed countries. In the old days, and I don't really know how far back we have to go, but not very far, our institutions of higher learning had exceeded high standards and they demanded the best from students, and they got it. Today, our system of higher education is a joke compared to campus life 20 years ago. Why, at Brown University, like Harvard, one of the eight elite 
Ivy League universities. The New York Times reported students set up a safe space that offered calming music, cookies, Play-Doh, and a video of frolicking puppies to help students cope with the discussion on how colleges should handle sexual assault. Well, boo freaking who? A Harvard student described in the university newspaper attending a safe space complete with massage circles that was designed to help students have open conversations, but not not too real of conversations, nothing that might actually hurt their feelings. We have raised a generation of overly coddled, self-absorbed girly boys and girly girls that have never learned how to become men and women. And since our education system is completely and totally dominated by progressives, our young people have had decades of liberal propaganda pumped into their skulls of mush, and the results are absolutely frightening. For example, one discovery from a survey was that 62% of millennials say that they are liberal, and 42% of them say they are socialists. Like there's a difference. I mean, that's like saying half of Mormons are Latter-day Saints. A different survey discovered that more than half of all U.S. adults under the age of 30 say that they reject capitalism. Yeah. Why is that? Because they're broke. And they want somebody to please give them a living wage so they can go off and get high and live. The rich have the money, so they should give us some. It's not fair that they have money to buy a new smartphone and we don't. We are forced to live with a phone that won't text any more than 500 times a month. I mean, come on. That's just not fair. If the coming election were to be determined by the millennials, Hillary Clinton would win by one of the biggest landslides in U.S. history. And the scary thing is, Earth Explorers... That if Hillary had not bought off the superdelegates with years of small manila envelopes of cash, Bernie would have won the primary by 22%. I don't know about you, but when the majority of the country thinks that private property should be banned, health care should be free to everyone, and kids should be able to stay in school for their whole lives with free housing and free food and free green tech mass transportation for everyone is very, very frightening. We would all starve, and then we would choke on our own human waste if no one worked.